welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia, everybody. Out. My name is Dina Halick. I'm the head of the fiction department here at the uh, Parkway Central branch. But I am also um, a person who co-hosts the Cookbook Club at the Philadelphia City Institute. <laughs> if, you are, if that sounds interesting to you, come see me afterwards. We'll talk. But you are here, all here to see Deb. <laughs> So you know, we all have that one website that we go to when we need a recipe or we need someone to answer a question and it's the one you go to and you know it's always going to be right. Yeah, Smitten Kitchen. That's her. So you created that way back when in a tiny, tiny New York City kitchen and two books later and two babies later. You're still in a tiny, tiny New York City kitchen. This is what success. Oh, can you hear me? <laughs> this is what success looks like. <laughs> Sorry, I um, <clears throat> I have a little bit of a cold, so um, just be glad you guys are over there. <laughs> We're all gonna dip ourselves in Purell after this. <clears throat> anyway, um, yeah. So yeah, two two kids and two books, and I'm still in a tiny kitchen. Progress. <laughs> but it's it's New York City. It's it's fairly it's the norm. I mean, I could have a bigger kitchen. I just don't know if I could have it in New York City. So I'm gonna pick, I'm gonna pick New York City, or as you know, I'm sure you have relate to it if you live around here too. <clears throat> so your website is crazy popular. Um, it is crazy. Why are you reading my noise? Like. <laughs> Um, no, it, it is. I mean, yes. I'm, I feel really lucky that um, people want to read my noise, and so I get to keep, you know, making noise. So well, I'm very good at the elevator pitch, guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely my specialty. So let's talk a little bit about how you interact with your fans and cooks <laughs> who want to talk to you. Like, I just kind of pigeonholed her upstairs and said, I tried your cookies. Tell me what I did wrong. And, um, I tried to find a back door, but there wasn't one. <laughs> I was like, gotta go. <laughs> the first time I met her, I actually hauled out my phone and showed her pictures of challah that I made. And I went, okay, um, please don't mock my braiding, but what did I do wrong here? And you were amazing. And you spent like 15 say? minutes sitting there and talking me through recipes. Do you do that with everybody? Like, how do you interact with your fans? I, I, would, I would love to diagnose your challah. Like, I... <laughs> I know, I mean it. I, I really enjoy, I like, I, I, I like it. It's, first of all, I'm very interested. I want to know what went wrong. And second of all, I want to know what went wrong. I mean, not just to fix it for you, but so I can know about it for somebody else. And also maybe write a better recipe that might, you know, accommodate what happened with you that I didn't see coming. So it's actually a little bit selfish. I mean, I just... I, 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 it's, it's like product research. <laughs> ah, so we're all fodder for your next recipe. <laughs> well, it's also like, you know, I, I like, you know, I've, we all get, I mean, we all get very involved. You know, we'll be working on a recipe and, you know, you're really caught up in it. You know, you're just spending a lot of time and money and you're really excited about it and it doesn't, if it doesn't go well, it's, I mean, I've been there a million times. It's so frustrating. And so, you know, getting stuck in that place when you're frustrated, maybe it was just a small thing that could have been different, um, such as like the time I made brownies and they were awful and it turned out I had forgotten the flour. You know, like, <laughs> it happens. Actually, they weren't, they weren't really that awful. Like, they, did, they didn't go in the garbage completely, <laughs> but they weren't, they weren't necessarily brownies. <laughs> So, so let's talk about recipe failures. How mm -hmm. often does recipe failure happen and how often are you able to actually fix it to make it a good recipe? Ooh. Recipe failures happen all the time for me. Um, and I handle it very poorly. Like I totally stomp out of the kitchen and I have a, like a little tantrum and I just like, I'm so mad at it. Like I get, so <laughs> I just want you to know if this is you or you might be more mature than me. So maybe this isn't you, but um, I just, I get so frustrated. It's the same thing. It's that investment of time and energy and hopes. And also it's dinner time and now you're hungry and you have like, you know, calcified, you know, pasta, like, that you can't even eat, and you're ordering, like, pizza delivery, and not even from the good place, but the place that can get it there in 10 minutes. Anyway, um, so I've been there, and I always get really mad, and I don't want to talk about it, and I don't want to look at it, and I don't want to think about it, and then, um, calm down. But honestly, I don't always come back to it, like, the next day. I often take a little break, however long of a break as I need. Um, this is why I would do really badly working in a magazine where you have to, like, write, go, you have to go back the next day and, like, get the, get it right. Um, excuse me. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, um, no, so I tend to kind of table it. I take all my notes, and then I, um, I come back to it when I have, like, a fresh view, either when I have a new idea of how I could do it differently, 
or I just am craving it again and I want to get it right. So for me, sometimes that pause is a day and sometimes that pause is a week and sometimes that pause is like two years. I will totally just not even think about it and then one day I'll be like, what happened with that cake I'd wanted to make? And then I'll find my notes and start again. I'm, I'm on a real tight schedule, as you can tell. <laughs> I, I'm, in the, I'm in the middle of a few things right now. <laughs> so, and, and this is interesting because I read your website and I just read your book. I've started cooking out of the new book already. And there's not a lot of overlap. <laughs> so I, I want the book to be separate. You know, I, first of all, I like to use the book as the sort of, I don't want to say an excuse, but a chance to kind of get some recipe demons out, some things that I've been wanting to work on that may take a little bit more time or don't seem like as good of a... Most of the things I think would work on the site, but not everything on the site I think works in a book. So um, in part, I want the book to be a value. I don't want it to be like, hi, I just printed up my website for you because you can do that on your own printers. And also, um, I like it to have its own its own piece that goes, you know, that works together, I hope. And what is it like? Because you, do you do all your recipe research in your home kitchen? All of my recipe research in my own kitchen. However, I don't get, okay, actually that's not entirely true. So I, I do, I only cook in my kitchen and I only cook basically for myself. It's a fairly selfish thing. Um, but, you know, I mean, I feed other people, but I pretty much cook when I want to cook as much as I can. You, sh it's try you should try it, actually. I feel like, <laughs> no, it's really great. Like, just cook what you want and just, you know, make enough for everybody, and <laughs> it's great. Anyway, um, so, but no, I actually get most of my recipe ideas completely outside the kitchen. Like, I don't walk into the kitchen and see a bundle of spinach and go, aha, you know, I have my next great thing. It's actually for me when I'm like on a train or in a taxi or looking out the window or on vacation or maybe I'm at like a restaurant and I try something and I go, oh, I wonder if I could do this with this. And so it really is for me outside the kitchen where disparate ideas sort of connect and then I try to jot them down as fast as possible and then when I'm back in the kitchen, I start playing around with it. But the, the fresh ideas, that's just, that's not where I get it. <laughs> <laughs> so, what it, so if you're in a restaurant and you eat something, you're like, ooh, what is the process of going back and reverse engineering one of those recipes? Okay, so a lot of times at a restaurant, it's like, oh, I want to order this, this sounds so good, and I have an image in my head of what it's going to be, and I get something that's totally different, and sometimes I like it, and sometimes I don't, but what I want is the first idea. So often it's just a piece of it, or I'm like, I really like the way they did these crispy spinach leaves on top. I think it would be better on something, you know, far more approachable for a home cook to make or that I would actually bother making at home. So it's not always a full reverse engineer. If it is, I might look around and see if they've publish the recipe somewhere. Like I, there's this restaurant in New York called Estella and I love like everybody else, they have this endive salad situation. I'm looking to see if there's any recognition. And it's like this great big <clears throat> heap of endive leaves and when you kind of dig in, there's this pot, it's like really, really good. And I've been wanting to reverse engineer it and I was so happy to find out that they'd run the recipe in Bon Appetit a couple years ago. So now I, <laughs> now I, it doesn't mean it's gonna work for me exactly as it tastes there because not all chef recipes kind of work well in individual sense, but um, at least I know where to start, <laughs> which turns out to be like an entire tin of anchovies. <laughs> no, it's so good. It's like salty and crunchy and, Fine, I won't share it with you. <laughs> I'll keep it to myself. <laughs> so, so that does actually, um, I, I've always wondered, because I keep thinking of that cookbooks are they're testing these things in these big test kitchens. You're doing it in your little kitchen. How do you professionally like, create a recipe and you take something that might be geared in a restaurant to like, lots of people and kind of narrow it down and make it accessible? I put it through the 5 p.m. filter or like the 5.49 p.m. filter and it's amazing how many steps you decide are not worth it in a recipe <laughs> at 5.49 when your children are going to come piling in that door at 5.58, like furiously hungry. I, um, yeah, for me, I just feel like the real life filter is like the one where all of a sudden it's so clear all the stuff that was extraneous um, and um, what was worth it. And maybe I cut too much and I want to add a couple things back if I have time, but I feel like it would be really useful to know the bare bones version that works. Um, and yeah, I mean, even if I'm excited about a dish, I get lazy too. I don't, I don't want to do 50, I don't want three sub recipes. Like, you know, not unless I am like, each of those elements is so important. So I feel like just putting it through the real life 
test kitchen of we're hungry and we need dinner is a really good way to make sure things are actually going to work for other people who are hungry. I mean, if I don't feel like doing it and I'm writing the recipe, <laughs> it's a pretty good sign that probably that stuff shouldn't be there. So aside from going to restaurants and thinking of things that maybe not the actual dish is what you want, but the idea of it is, do you follow any cooks, any blogs, any other areas of inspiration? Who are your gurus? Oh since my you goodness. Seem to mine? I follow, um, I follow everyone. I re no, I really do. If, I mean, anything that comes across my screen, I'm like pretty excited to read. I, um, I follow a lot of food blogs. I follow magazines. I feel like I'm like the last person to discover taste.com or taste cooking. Wonder, they have such great food and articles. I feel like they're really, either I just discovered them in the last year or they're really ramping up in the last year or they've been around forever and I'm just really slow. All things, probably the last one's the most possible. But um, I get so many, not just recipe ideas, but I love the writing that they're doing on food these days. Um, yeah, so all the magazines, all the newspaper sections. I like, it's sort of like a grabbing thing where like whatever comes across my threshold and then I just kind of push it all away because it's too much noise and then start thinking about what I really want to do. But I like the idea of filling your creative well in as many ways as you can. Definitely. So can you, we had, we had a little conversation about butter upstairs and how wonderful it is. I mean, so, <laughs> obviously. How, how do you balance wanting delicious food and wanting to not be 300 pounds? Butter her. goes to other people. <laughs> no, in general, though, I mean, I'm not usually baking cookies just to keep them around the apartment. I'll make sure that we have some for tonight and some for tomorrow. But in general, like if I'm making a cake or a dessert, it's usually to share. It's for a party or a dinner. I just, I mean, I don't really need that around. I feel like you enjoy it the first time, you enjoy it the second time, and then it's not that you don't enjoy it, but in general, I don't. I don't need to have like large, I want to have my leftovers from dinner around, not the leftovers from dessert as much. So I feel like it's like a good excuse where you can try things. It turns out that if you call a friend and you say, I have too much chocolate cake, they always have time for you to come over. <laughs> Gosh, guys, I've been testing blueberry muffins this week and I am drowning in blueberry muffins. My, I, like my friends who I, like it takes like 4,900 texts you know, group text to get a dinner together, but if I say I have extra blueberry muffins, it's like, people just appear at my door. <laughs> um, it's very, it's very easy to share baked goods. Um, the, you know, this, the spinach, kale, strata, you know, wasn't the same stampede. It's okay, more for me. So I feel like bake what you want to bake, just find people who want to who want to share it with you. Ah, you know, you're much uh, less food hoardy than I am. <laughs> so. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm fine. Things are fine. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, not gonna, not gonna get anyone sick tonight. <laughs> Sorry, did you have another question? No, that's. I I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna. I'm gonna play and wait. <laughs> no, don't. No, keep talking. <laughs> Let's take some. Uh... <laughs> well, so one of the big things in the last few years is kind of the appeal of cooking from scratch and kind mm -hmm. of also exploring kind of cultural recipes, kind of going back and finding the roots of things. Mm -hmm. So what do you think, why is this so big now, hmm. do you think? I, I don't know, is, is it true? I'm like, I'm trying to think, is it really? I definitely think we have this revitalization in home cooking. I feel like there's more food magazines and more food content out there than ever before, but I'm not, I mean, is it, I'm just trying to think, I'm, is it really different, the interest in history? But I feel like there's a thirst for home cooking, that there is, like, it's really strong. And I don't know if it's just this era of dining in, you know, where restaurant food seems so fussy and expensive and maybe not relatable, and we all just want to, like, kind of hibernate and hide from the world sometimes. I mean, <laughs> the news, the world. Anyway, um, <laughs> I don't know if it's just, like, the age we're in or if it's just, you know, us going through waves of, you know... Um, when I, I feel like when I kind of <laughs> ostensibly became an adult, um, <laughs> I kind of realized I didn't know how to cook a lot of really basic things. I just, you know, I'd, I hadn't really learned how to like roast chicken and make meatballs. I'd done them before. I could follow a recipe, but I didn't really have like my go-tos. And once you figure them out at home and then you go to a restaurant and they're making roast chicken, you're kind of like, maybe 
maybe I'll just stay in and invite friends over. So I feel like it could be it could be a lot of things, like the mood of the world. It could be that it's a lot easier to get good ingredients, you know, depending on where you live. It could be meal kits. I know they're getting a lot of my friends to cook who otherwise weren't cooking a lot. I know you must imagine that my friends all cook my recipes and whatever, but most of my friends actually don't cook at all. Um, <laughs> I have friends who only recently stopped keeping their sweaters in their ovens for storage. Um, so, like these, but the meal kits, I think, really... Um, I've gotten a lot of people I know start, like they'll tell me like I made this thing last night and it was really cool. I think next time I'm gonna just buy the ingredients and make it myself, which has gotta be really liberating, like a way to get you started. Definitely. I kinda went all over the way all over the place with that answer. No, that's fine. Okay. This is that's like fine. standard practice for me, so <laughs> <laughs> So do you have any interesting tips that you do in the kitchen to make life easier for yourself? Mm. Kitchen hacks. I'm about to sneeze. <laughs> Nope, lost it. Um, I am a, okay, so this is a kind of unpopular thing, but I sort of feel like, I don't, is it unpopular? I have this thing where as much as you can, if you've had a long day and the idea of cooking is very unappealing, don't do it. No, I, I don't mean this, like, I didn't even mean to be like a, I just mean that, like, I try to be protective of, of, and a lot of that was coming out when I was writing this book, this idea that I love to cook and I love to find new recipes and I want to cook things I'm excited about and I'm not always... I was trying to preserve my natural inclinations, my natural joy in the kitchen by not squishing it down by making things that weren't, you know what I mean? Obviously not every day is going to be like, you know, we all, we all use rotisserie chicken and frozen tortellini and whatever works, you know, whatever your, we do scrambled eggs and toast, but I just sort of feel like whenever I start saying, I'm going to cook five, seven days this week, you know, and I, I, and you get really burnt out and, um, that generally for me leads to like a whole week of not cooking, even me. So I, I feel like, you know, go with your mood and don't push yourself to what you don't want to do. Because then what will happen is after a day of, you know, where we have scrambled eggs and another day where we did take out pizza and another day with rotisserie, I would do anything to make a homemade meal. And so I kind of feel like it always comes back if you don't um, crush it. I feel like this is true of a lot of natural <laughs> things. Like, you know, we're, we're, I just, so I try to be protective of it. Again, it's also a luxury to be able to do takeout and whatever else. And, you know, I happen to live someplace where it's pretty easy. But I, even then, you know, a day or two of that, I'm so ready to cook again. So that's one thing. Um, I also feel like, you know, like the other piece of that is is not to feel guilty if you're not cooking like a three course meal every night. Like that's crazy. Who said you should do that? Like Martha? Like I don't know who. <laughs> no, but who does that? Yes, really? Martha. Okay, but like she's not doing that. I mean, she can come over and do it for me. No, but I just think you know get get the get the guilt and the pressure out of it, and you'll start enjoying it more. And also, I mean, this is just a shift in my life, but I used to hate leftovers. I was like, oh man, we have to eat that again. Now I'm like, oh my God, why didn't I triple this recipe? <laughs> I am so happy. I'm like, put it in the freezer and then like sometime next month you have like a lot of frozen pasta or good soup or whatever. So now I'm like, I don't know who that person was. Leftovers are the best thing or making extra. Like if you're going to go put the time into it to double it and make two so you have it later. I feel like you guys are like, we've been telling you this for years, Dad. <laughs> you're a little slow to it, but I'm glad you got there. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a really active comment section on your website. Like, and it's great. It's not like one of those horrible, horrible comment sections where they say, don't read the comments. Reading the comments on your website is fantastic. I have the nicest comment section on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> no, I really do. Everyone is so nice. Like, I... I don't, I, I almost never have to like delete a comment because it's just like nasty or distracting, you know, like it's just, it's so rare. And you have, you actually answer a lot of people in the comments, so you're very active in it also, right? It's like my procrastination. <laughs> it's like, oh, I have an article due, oh, I haven't read the comments yet today, like I love it. <laughs> I love, but I also, like, why would I want to, like, first of all, it's reviews. So I want to hear how the recipe went. I mean, because it's always like, let's say... I'm making something and like I make it 10 times and one of the times this weird thing happens but you know maybe a recipe tester makes it and everything's fine I guarantee every comment is going to be about that one thing that you thought like never happened so I like to check in and see how things are going I like to 
hear how people used it. I kind of I love hearing um, the tweaks, like when someone's like, "Actually, I just skipped this," and I'm like, "Oh, maybe we could have skipped that." And then they'll t I, I so I yes, why would I? I, I want to hear how it's going. <laughs> Do you ever take feedback from the comments and adjust the recipe? All, all the time, because if 10 people are like, you know, the first person's like, this was a disaster. <laughs> and I'm like, it was probably that. And then the second person does, and you're like, okay, <clears throat> probably it's not. <laughs> I'm, sensing, I'm sensing a pattern. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it hasn't, fortunately, isn't usually that dramatic. But yeah, no, I mean, if there's definitely a problem, I'll go back and try to address it. Um, but um, sometimes it's just a little thing where, you know, three different people come back and say there's too much salt or too little salt, or I hear a lot that my portion sizes aren't how people feel portion sizes should be. <laughs> um, so I will, you know, make no, it just, it makes for a better recipe if it works for more people. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take the free product research. <laughs> we'll mine the comments to make better recipes. But um, no, it helps, and it helps me next time because when I'm writing a recipe, I'm like, no, that's not going to work. People hate it when I do that, or no, nobody, nobody wants to, nobody wants to Julianne like ever. Um, <laughs> nobody wants to, you know, like, and if you're going to do the step, you have to explain why it's worth it or explain why, you know. So I find it really helps me write better recipes because when I know what the the turn, you know, like the things that people are just like, I'm out. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> the recipe goes to page two, and I'm out. <laughs> so aside from julienning, what are some of the things that people don't like that you have started avoiding? Seafood. Um, I don't. Not everyone. Anchovies, fennel. Um, I know <laughs> walnuts. I mean, it's not everyone, but like anything I do with walnuts, people are going to say, "Can I do it with almonds?" Um, what else? Um, if it's meat, can I make it without meat? Um, if it's, you know, dried beans, can I make it with, you know, canned beans? I mean, that's, that's normal, though. Um, my, you know, like, this is calls for six ounces of lettuce, but the clamshells are five ounces. See, that actually is, like, a good thing for me to know. I was thinking about that a lot with this book, trying to make sure as much as I could line things up to package sizes where they work, because there's this one recipe, and I kept using it with one leek, but I, wherever I buy leeks, they're always in bundles of three. I was like, what happens if I just make it with three? It's a slightly different pie, but I actually really liked it, so... Here to help <laughs> um, myself, who doesn't want the extra stray leak in my fridge. Um, what else? My God. Um, always, um, you know, if it's a big tomatoes, can I make it with grape? I mean, a lot of it's just accessibility stuff, but there's definitely things that I know there's lots of people who like them, but it's just, um, you know, it's always going to be, can I make it with gl gluten-free? Can I make it without flour? Can I make it without eggs? Can I make it without dairy? Can I make it kosher? How could you put this in food? I'm so disappointed. <laughs> no, but it's just, it's usually nice stuff, but they're definitely like, I would say fennel. There's a salad in the new book, which is like the fennel pear, like I actually call it like the hater salad, because <laughs> like everyone hates the stuff. Oh, celery. Why did, what? I love celery. I love celery. People do not like, they're not happy about celery. <laughs> I love celery. It's good with peanut butter on it. I mean, also good with peanut butter on it. So anyway, so I just sometimes I just put all those things together into one place, and I eat it myself. I don't, <laughs> I don't need to share with you. Um, so what's your favorite recipe? Oh, my God. You have to give me a, a subsection. Okay. Because, um, um, appetizer. Appetizer. Okay, I'm super into the melty cheese thing right now. There's a baked camembert in the back of the book. I, camembert sounds really fancy, but I want you to know that I get the $3 ones at Trader Joe's, and they're fine. I will always test with the cheapest version of... No, it's fine. And they're... Um, so it's this thing, and um, you put some herbs and garlic and olive oil and salt and pepper in it, and then you just um, you bake it just until it, it basically becomes a cheese dip, and then people just descend on it like... <laughs> I mean, that's what happens usually, you know, and it's, it's like my, f I don't do cheese plates anymore. I don't, I don't go to an expensive cheese store and buy all these wedges and then you have to put out all those knives and crackers and it's so fussy. I just do this. I'll set up a few of them before we have people over and then I'll just warm them up as needed. And I think it calls for 350 in the, in the, um, cookbook, but if your roast isn't at 325 or at 375, it's it's fine. Just keep an eye on it. You're just warming it up. And it's my favorite thing. And I, I started it as an appetizer 
last year, I think, when we did a Friendsgiving, and then I did that thing that <laughs> editors hate when I was like, I need to add this to the book. I'm sorry, I have to add this to the book. <laughs> um, but I still make it all the time. I feel like everyone needs a good, like, melty cheese situation. It's more popular than any other appetizer, and it's less work. That is impressive. Okay, melty cheese, always. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the difference between writing for your blog and writing for a book? <sighs> Um, you know, it should be the same. I thought when I wrote a book that it would be like, the, like everybody was like, it's going to be so easy for you because you've been doing this for years. You've been writing and doing recipes and taking pictures, and for some reason, <laughs> I'm like paralyzed every time. I think it's more that you're trying to create something that works together. Um, like I just used, you know, brown butter and four. <laughs> you know, you you if you're in a little phase where you're super into an ingredient, it shows up too much. So it's the balance thing. It's a little bit trying to make sure it's not too close to anything on this site. Well, you know, or in and if it's different, if it overlaps slightly, like why and what you're doing with it that's new. I feel like it's really just the pressure of creating like a standalone body is way different. I mean, on the blog, I can just do whatever I feel like cooking that day. It doesn't have to match what came the week before or really work for anything besides I felt like making it, you know, because there's a very large body. But the with a cookbook, it you know, it needs to work sort of cover to cover. Um, what else? I um, I always find it's a different section each time, but it sort of comes up short, and then one section comes out too long, and then killing your darlings, as they say. Um, and um, I also tend to go a little crazier with the recipe testing in books just because, you know, like it's a printed page and stuff. You can't just edit the document and fix it. Um, so on the site, I pretty much do everything myself and test all the recipes and have somehow gotten away with it so far. But um, for the cookbooks, I hire professional recipe testers, and it's a much longer and far more expensive process. <laughs> Um, and we appreciate the fact that everything is so well tested. Yes, there will never be a typo in a book because of this ever. And there's definitely <laughs> not two already. No, sorry. <laughs> Minor ones. Minor. It's fine. Um, Judith Jones uh, apparently used to say that you know a book isn't an, is an error free until it's um, third printing. <laughs> so I shouldn't have bought it when it came out. Scary. I should have waited. <laughs> no. They're, they're minor. There's minor and there's major. There's things that nobody will notice that will drive me crazy. And then there's things that, you know, don't worry, we'll warn you. <laughs> Hi, Deb. My name's Rebecca, and it's a pleasure to have you here in Philadelphia. Thank um, you. You're such a great storyteller. This is my first time hearing you um, in person. And I just wanted to know, how did you become such a good storyteller? Because that's what really draws me to your recipes, especially the second book. I've been reading the prologue to each recipe, just hearing about your husband and the kids, and especially the trips you take. Just want to hear a little bit about how your storytelling um, skill developed. Wow, thank you, first of all. Um, thanks. Um, um, I, don't, I don't know. I just, I talk a lot. <laughs> I've always, I talk a lot. Um, I would say that when I started blogging in the dark ages, um, writing was a little more awkward. It's like a muscle, you know, like, and I hadn't been using it, and I felt like writing stories took a long time. In the same way, like, if I write for a new publication or whatever, it takes me forever to write three sentences. It's just, you know, I didn't have my, it doesn't feel comfortable yet, but over time, it just became, as I said, it's like, it's like a muscle, and you, you exercise, and, and I felt like the amount of time it took for an idea in my head to sound like the idea in front of me on paper, um, screen, paper, that's adorable, um, <laughs> precious, um, it was, it was very, it was, it's very, it's very quick for me, so at this point I can, I pretty much, most things get written quickly, or they just don't flow right for me, um, but yeah, it's just practice. So I always feel like if somebody wants to write but they feel awkward doing it, like just do it a lot. Just do it every day. Write bad stuff. You know, like write terrible. We all write terrible things. And then, um, and also I loved reading. Um, I've probably referenced at least twice in things I've said already. But I loved. I always loved Anne Lamott's Bird by Bird. It's such a great book about writing, and it just makes you feel like so much less. Um, I, it really helped me finish the first book um, because when I write intros for the site, I'm basically writing about like, here's what happened. I did, it's very fresh. But when you have like a hundred, you know, and I, I tend to write them as I go, but editing a hundred, you know, 25 separate I 
essays when you're not in that moment anymore was hard to finish. Um, and I found it really helpful. And she talks a lot about just, she always says to just write a terrible first draft, like get it out and then just throw it away and now write what you meant to write. Um, lots of, I've picked up lots of great advice. One of my other favorite things is just, just start with the second paragraph. Just like no prologue, just get right in there. Like I just, so especially if you're having trouble, like, you know, we always get trouble stuck at the top, but you know what you want to say. Um, Anyway, I can just keep going. <laughs> but just some things that have worked over the years. And then there are things that just never work, and I can never figure out how to say them. So. Hi, Deb. Um, Hi. I love you. <laughs> I'm sure I'm not alone in that. I just realized, talking to my new friend, Bernice here, um, I just realized that I've been reading you for over 10 years. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's crazy, because I'm 22, and it's like, yeah. how can I be 22 if my blog is 11 yeah, years really old, right? It's really amazing how you've been it's crazy. this blog since you were like nine. So. I know. <laughs> it was a very precocious child. <laughs> Um, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, but my question is, I'm wondering if there's a recipe that you wrote, or a couple, or one that comes to mind, that you're like, I can't believe I'm writing a recipe for this. Like, this feels like everyone must already have their, mm -hmm. you know, blueberry muffin. Everyone yeah. must already have their egg sandwich recipe. I can't believe I'm putting this on the blog. I can't believe I'm putting this in a book. Like, and, or like the one that you wrote like that that was the most successful. They tend to be the most popular recipes is the funniest thing. I um, I have, like, especially in a cookbook, like, I want my goal is for each page to open and, like, you to be like, that's, it is a thing, you know, that you could make and eat. Like, so I don't really do, like, I don't know. I don't do, like, sauce sections or, like, compound. Like, no, I don't really want stray recipes. Like, I want everything to work in. But on the site, sometimes I just, I really want to talk about, I know, I know, it, like, makes everybody roll their eyes like avocado toast. <laughs> This is why I don't have a mortgage. What was that article? Like, this is why I can't buy a house. Kids these days, they're avocado toast. Um, but I, I have a very specific way I like to make it, and it's because I had it this very specific way at the cafe that kind of made the avocado toast thing blow up all these years ago. And um, I think you just have to explain it and explain why. And I'm always surprised because those posts tend to be really popular. Um, and I think it's because when you're coming home from, you know, you don't necessarily want to cook, you're like, oh, all right, I'll try the, I'll try Deb's technique on this. Um, and sometimes it's stuff that I feel like has been well covered everywhere else. Um, I recently wrote about um, this pasta and chickpeas that you is like three ingredients or five ingredients. And um, it had been on many other sites before. It's, it's like Marcella Hazan's three ingredient tomato sauce. But they're some of the most popular recipes on the site because, I don't know, this, it, it, it's, I think the simplicity works. You just need to explain what it works for and what it doesn't. Um, but I also had that feeling when I shared a recipe for pecan pie a couple years ago. I was like, who needs to... I thought everybody who makes it has a recipe that they like. What you, why do you need a recipe from me for it? But then I made that recipe that everyone uses, and I'm like, eh, I think I can do some stuff here. So that's kind of where it went. And then, and then as I kept making it for another couple of years, it turned into the version that's in the book because I, I started adding chocolates in the bottom. And then I don't know about you guys, but when I'm making pecan pie, it's usually for like a minimum of 12 people because it's Thanksgiving. And so the pie that only has eight wedges isn't going to cut it, so I did this, I, yeah. <laughs> it's going to make you really popular this year. <laughs> Hi, Deb. Um, I'm here with one of my best friends. We actually bonded seven years ago when we met and became roommates over your baked potato soup and blog. Um, <laughs> it's a stuff of legends in our friendship and those who know us. Yeah, an extra pounds. That's right. Um, <laughs> Just here to hop. I, <laughs> Sorry. I, one of my favorite things in seeing your blog kind of evolve is when you're featured um, on different websites. And I remember you going into like a New York bodega and taking like the ramen noodles <laughs> and all these different cool and things that you love and you're like, these are some of my favorite things to just kind of get. Um, so my question for you is, especially when you touch upon, you don't bring up like sauces and things, you're more of a cohesive uh -huh. like dish or meal. What are some non-traditional pantry staples that you love to have that can really elevate mm. an everyday dish? Mm. Interesting. Um, 
You know, I always keep, I, I, I grow, I have a pot of chives. I didn't know, like, this is a little I know about gardening, but, like, I, you know, bought them the first year I had a garden. Turns out they come back on their own. Like, if you have a warm week in January, you have chives again. Like, anyway, I, it's not really a pantry staple, but they're one of those things. It's, like, one of my favorite things to have outside. Um, I love them just to finish, like, most things. I like the little flavor. Um, what else? I don't know. We always have... Um, because my husband is Russian, and we always have pelmeni and varaniki, and I'm saying them poorly, in the freezer. Proper Russians, um, you know, you don't get, um, I also have a recipe for them in the book, but that's more of a special occasion thing. Um, what else? Um, we usually have blintzes in the freezer, too. Let me think. Um, I don't know. I'm like, cookie dough in the freezer that's not that odd what about stuff like I don't know pomegranate molasses is huge I right do now. have pomegranate molasses and I don't use it nearly as much as I anticipated using it when I got <laughs> it um, I'm trying to think of some of my other like favorite weird staples um, I don't know I have a lot of spices I feel like spices like if you go to a spice store like we have Kalustians in New York City and Sahadi's out in Brooklyn and um, it's sort of like I feel like it's such an inexpensive way to splurge. It's sort of like you can go shopping and go a little crazy and then your bill is like $25. Like it's like, but it really lasts and lasts. So if you're getting into like Indian or Middle Eastern cooking or whatever, I find it so fun to go and like pick up like the stuff. So then, I mean, because most of the, like let's say you want to get into Indian cooking, like most of the ingredients are actually fairly inexpensive. It's just you need to get your spice cabinet up. Um, so I, I have a lot of, I have a lot of spices. I have, an un unusual, I have an unusual amount of sprinkles, too. Um, I just, I can't, it's the same thing. It's just like a $4 jar. I'm just going to buy another one, and then another one, and then I realize I'm, like, drowning in sprinkles. Um, so if you see stuff with a lot of sprinkles, and it's just because I'm trying to use up my own personal supply. Um, no, I'm like, what else do I keep around? I always have scallions in the fridge. I always have hard-boiled eggs around. I always have like three different levels of butter. <laughs> you've got like this super good stuff that you put on bread, then you've got the stuff for baking. Maybe two Are levels of butter. Are you a salted or an unsalted butter person for baking? Salted for um, spreading. Like okay. the good European salted stuff, definitely. But I don't need to bake cookies with that. Like I'm not, I'm not that fancy. Um, and then I usually use unsalted for baking. I think salt is actually fine in most baked goods. You just need to adjust the salt um, accordingly, but because all brands have different levels of salt, if you're writing recipes, it helps to start at a base and tell people how much to put in. Hmm. Or they yell at you. <laughs> <laughs> politely. Politely. Your fans don't yell. Sometimes. I mean, if you made a batch of cookies and they were inedibly salty, you'd be pretty mad about it. It's fair. Sure. <laughs> Hi, Deb. I've also been following you for a really long time, <laughs> and uh, you're probably one of the first bloggers I started following. Thank you. Um, I don't even know at this point when that was. Uh, but I've also now been blogging myself in the last year, and I know that the blog like realm has seriously changed in the years that you've mm -hmm. been working. But if there's any advice for new bloggers or people who are getting into food writing, what would you tell them now? I would, I would say keep doing it. I mean, even if it doesn't become like the biggest thing in your full-time job, it's always a set of writing that you can help. I mean, if, if your focus is writing or food, whatever it is, I mean, it's basically, you know, we think of blogging as a style, but it really is just self-publishing. And if you're trying to get yourself out there and try to convince people to hire you or you want to turn it into a job, you have to have a body of work somewhere. But if people aren't going to hire you because you're, they don't know your work, I mean, it's a good place to get started. I mean, if you have good work, you have good work. Um, and I think that if you have good work and you're, I don't think that you need to keep a tight schedule. I mean, I feel like people say you have to pick a schedule and stick to, I feel like that could lead to like subpar content. Write when you have something to write, share when you have something to share. Don't ever feel like you're just filling a blank page and what you will collect is a body of work that you are proud of. And when somebody comes there, they'll keep reading and see everything else and, and know what you're about. So I feel like there's really no harm in doing it, and if nothing else, it becomes, it can make you a better writer. So I said, I really learned to write by just doing it every day um, until it got easier. Hi, Deb. Hi. Thank you so much for being here. I'm sure it's a pleasure for all of us. This is crazy. It's a pleasure for you. Um, quick question. I know you're pretty vocal about um, your food opinions, which I've appreciated so much on the blog and just how candid you are about 
how you feel about certain ingredients or mm -hmm. certain trends. Um, <laughs> not a bad thing at all, great thing. Um, but what is one food trend, either restaurant um, cooking or home cooking wise, recently that you just sort of hate or just can't, can't stand? How long do we have? <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> Here comes the scroll across the floor. <laughs> um, those spear ice cubes make me irrationally angry. I hate being thwacked in the face when I'm having a cocktail. Or <laughs> I don't know if this is like just a Jewish thing, but like I am. Sorry. Um, I just, I hate them. They make me so mad. So those th so that's one. I don't like tweezer food. I don't like little cubes of food spread out. I want like, I don't want like, you know, would you and Julia Child once say like it's beautiful, but you know somebody's fingers have been all over it. Like you don't really want to feel that some chef has been like touching, touching, touching your food. <laughs> I'm sure they wash their hands. Like, I definitely don't think they come to work with a head cold or anything. <laughs> um, I, um, I don't like speeches about food. I mean, I want, I want food that stands for... It's sometimes nice to hear a little bit of the origin if you ask, but, like, having to sit through one is... I mean, restaurants are supposed to be about gathering with your friends and hanging out and having a nice time, and I like the restaurants to kind of be in the background of that or maybe be the highlight of it because the food's really good. Um, I don't, I'm, this is just me, but I hate it when a restaurant food is, well, I mean, it depends on what you're looking for in a restaurant, but like, I have friends who went out to some restaurant in New York, and they had just such a rich, like, it was so over the top, every single thing, and they just came home and they felt not like that was the best birthday dinner ever, but like, it was grotesque, there was no <laughs> island of... Of, like one of my favorite restaurants in New York tends to be ones that really have a good balance where you know you know when you're ordering something rich but there's also things um, I um, I'm just getting started <laughs> <laughs> um, no but I there's yeah there's I mean I again it's a luxury to get to eat out you know and like live in a place where there's so many good restaurants most of it is I think in the service of good when there's more things out there and everyone's excited about it like we all rising tide and all that but <laughs> there's always a, oh and there's oh the the slate thing I want plates I love plates <laughs> I love plates plates are wonderful um what am I thinking one more oh god I think the worst one I just I keep thinking about those sphere ice cubes <laughs> <laughs> I just is it just, I think it hit in the face with an ice cube um, when you're trying to have your drink is mean um, I this is just me I know some people do it well but I don't want, I'm not very interested in like a restaurant's take on a Manhattan <laughs> that's just me I'm a curmudgeon guys like I just I just want a good one. Yeah. I just want everyone to fight over making the best one, not the most. But I know that the way the restaurants work, and if you're a chef and you're trying, to, you have to kind of create a unique spin on things. But um, then you go to a place like, well, France, or like the classic way it was, where everyone's competing just to make the best of the classics. And I think there's something to that. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your background in terms of training or inspiration and how you got into cooking? Sure. Um, I am, I'm not trained. I'm just, everything's just trial and error for me. I am, I mean, my family cooked growing up, but I haven't been to cooking school. I've taken some classes over the years. Like, I felt like I was really bad at making bread, so I took a bread making class. I'm kind of excited to take a sourdough class in January. You're going to hear a lot about that in the new year. Sorry in advance. It's so good. <laughs> um, I, um, but no, I just, it's really trial and error for me, but I, um, I like it because I've sort of figured things out on my own, um, and um, you know I've, I've kind of worked through everything. And then I, you know, again, I, I just read everything I can pick up. And when I run into trouble with a recipe, I I try to get an answer. But um, no formal training, just winging it and seeing what works. So we know if it works for her, we could probably manage it ourselves. Too. <laughs> I think. I mean. You know, and it, you work hard enough and long enough at something, you should hopefully not be the worst at it. Um, <laughs> trial and error, you know. Um, wow, that's a great answer, Deb. <laughs> and uh, on that note, <laughs> maybe there's a more upbeat question. <laughs> well, Deb will be, the, we don't have time for any more questions, unfortunately. Uh -oh. But Deb is going to be upstairs signing her books. Oh, and did we want yeah, to Yeah, and I will her. say, hang on, hang on. Since I, She's super sick, 
So no, I'm just I'm obviously maybe not. So I un, I'm not offended if you do not want to be in my airspace this evening. Like it's fine. If you just want a straight signed book, we I pre-signed a lot, you know, without waiting for a personal inscription. If you do want to get, you know, be in the sign, happy to sign your book. There is Purell there. It's a big open room. I will not breathe down your neck. Um, you know, so I just want to let you know there's options. I am one of those people, when I hear somebody sick, I just want to get, like, as far away as possible. So we will see you upstairs. <laughs>